started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I posted Lab 4 for you guys to take a look at. If you have any, let me take a look at Lab 4. Okay. Well, the slide has on that slide. Okay. Well, uh, the proper <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any questions on Lab 4? Those that have looked at it already? So, for all the features that we have to go through, does it have to be like really thorough in terms of like features that we have to define stories for? Or? Uh, so if you read the third assignment on there, you'll see that the grand, really granular user stories are only for what you're going to put in your MVP. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. So there's a high level, like all, obviously, give me all the features, okay. do the roadmap, and then you're going to figure out what's the most compelling set of, like, feature or features that you need to build, and you're going to have to drill in the okay. user stories just for that. So I've limited the scope. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants to click through your turn. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? On lab four? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just being slow on getting lab three as grades to you and quiz two grades, but I will do my best to get them either by the end of the week or early next week. Um, and then there's still time to apply. Uh, I think tomorrow is a deadline, so there's a couple groups that told me they're going to apply. So here's your good chance. All right, so last time we covered the difference between user stories and storytelling, because I know there was some amount of confusion, because everyone's still cool. If not, I will, oh, that's right, I also have to post up a bunch of recordings, so I'll, I'll do that as well. Um, but is everybody clear on the difference between user stories, how to create them, how to prioritize them, and then storytelling? Okay. And then we went over uh, one of my favorite lectures, which is pricing. So we talked about what exactly is pricing, right? So what is, what is pricing? From last week. Yeah, kind of. Isn't it determining uh, the perceived value of your product? Sure. And the key thing in that is we're not talking necessarily just monetary value, but a whole bunch of, of things related to it. Because it doesn't always come down to just the price point, but there's more factors that people think about. Uh, and then we talked about why why do we price and um, why should you price? So what did you say, you know, why is it that we price? Yeah. To signal to the um, customer what we believe the product is worth. Okay, so we're sending a signal of what we think the product is worth. Anything else? Any other reasons? Yeah. Um, I said this last time, but I don't know if it was like, Agreed uh, to uh, <laughs> <laughs> position your product amongst other competitors in yeah. terms of quality, like what you want to communicate as a quality yeah. level. Yeah, that's true as well. That's a similar signal. Anything else? Any other reason to price? So that customers become attached to it rather than giving it free. Okay. So that you make okay. Well, sure. Nice. <laughs> Okay. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about also if we put a price, then we get a sense of what customers want, right? So at some point, they start to guide some of our development. Uh, and this is why we talked about, you know, when we should price. So when is it that we should price? Early. Early, okay. And, and often. And often, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's true. I did, I did say both. There was a slide that said both. Okay, and then we covered some different ways of doing pricing, so I won't get into all the flavors of that. We'll save that for another time. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about pricing, um, but we're really going to talk about analytics and metrics. So you remember in our product uh, development lecture, I talked to you about the product roadmap, and I gave you some examples of metrics. Here we're going to dig in deeper, and there is a section in your lab four where I'm going to ask you for uh, to provide some metrics for each of the features. So, you know, don't just use the generic ones that I posted on the roadmap. Uh, think about using some of these that I'm, I'm going to give you today uh, on Thursday. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how you actually go about collecting types of metrics, uh, collecting metrics, and then what are the various types of metrics that we're dealing with. And then we'll end with an exercise. So uh, basically, analytics is uh, the discovery of patterns within a set of data, right? A lot of times we have all this data, like how often somebody logs in or uses a product or what, what price point they're converting at, and all this is great, 
but unless we can develop some patterns, it's hard to then start to uh, scale and attract more customers, right? So this is the reason that we use analytics. Uh, compare that to a metric. So a business metric is basically a measurement that you're taking to figure you know, something out, such as ROI. So, hey, I did this marketing campaign, how many customers did we get? Or, hey, I added this cancellation button, you know, what, what did our churn rate become? Um, so like that, for everything that you do, you want to gauge uh, some, some level, of, to take some sort of measurement. So why do you think we need analytics and metrics? What's the purpose of it? To prove hypotheses. Okay, yep, we are conducting experiments after all. So yeah, uh, prove that, and not only that, but we're also dealing with a lot of uncertainty, right? We're a startup, we have to do what's effective, and part of that is taking measurements as we conduct our experiments, and then see what worked well, and then pursuing that. And if it didn't, it's a matter of re figuring out how to change the experiment. So uh, the other thing, though, is before you get into coming up with analytics and metrics, you do want to take some time to figure out what your hypothesis is. And the reason I say that, uh, actually, can someone say, can someone tell me why that might be important? Why do we need to state our hypothesis and not just be like, oh, let's figure out whatever happens, whatever the result is? Are you raising your hand, or are you just? I was going to say, I mean, you need to have a, like a target for your uh, your analytics and metrics. Sure, but why? So you, you, know need to, you need to know what you're trying to disprove. So what information you have to gather? To, okay. You're trying to have a direction. Okay. So if you don't have any concept of what that direction is, sure. then you're just like wildly playing from side to side. Okay. So you're trying to prove something for yourself. Sure. Are there any signal processing majors in here? Or, uh, yeah. Okay, so you all know what this concept of sample size, right? Yeah. So sometimes you might even get like terrible results, but if your sample size is so small, like why even bother? You might need to run the same results again. So yeah, stating your hypothesis and figuring out what your direction is going to be, like uh, Curl said and like Darren said, is important so that you can figure out whether the results are actually worthy or you know you're actually not. They need to throw them out and rerun the test until you can not necessarily meet or beat the hypothesis, but until you get some substantial results. So we're now in this phase of the process where we're taking feedback and improvement, but a lot of that comes down to you know measurements, right? So based on what we measure, then we can consider whether the feedback was worthwhile and whether or not we should improve and, and make enhancements. So unfortunately, what happens is a lot of times people will do any sort of measurement, right? Any, anything that they um, think is an interesting big number, and they'll say that that's their business metric. And this is what's known as a vanity metrics. Okay? They're just literally being vain. Um, so anything you read, like almost anything you read on TechCrunch is most likely a vanity metric, right? So they'll read something like, oh, we send out 10 million emails a day, or we receive 1 million likes overnight. <coughs> Right, these are vanity metrics. Now, why do you think that these are vanity metrics? Yeah. Because they don't indicate like any consistency over time. It could just be like one peak. Good. And, and also some of them could accumulate and it could be it could be like a hundred likes over years. Sure. It really doesn't also give you um, a sense of quality of the product. <coughs> so it could right. just be like off a really good advertisement and like the product could be absolute terrible. So. Exactly. Did you have something to add, Jerry? There's no relative comparison with your competitors you're getting. Right. Um, it doesn't actually drive any revenue. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's assuming that revenue is some, a goal. Sometimes revenue isn't always the primary, but you're absolutely right. So, you guys gave good answers as to why these are vanity metrics. So let's talk about then what good metrics actually are. Um, and a number of you already kind of hinted. So the first is that they're comparative. Right? We can compare, hey, we had 1 million likes yesterday, and today we have 2 million. Okay, it's still not getting out the product, et cetera, but hey, there's at least some basis of comparison. It's not just one overnight success. Uh, the second is that it has to be understandable. And by understandable, we don't just mean, hey, people understand what 1 million likes is, but that it relates back to the business. Uh, sometimes people do really odd metrics. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, unfortunately. Uh, but it, it, it's almost like too data science-y that 
you know, a business person wouldn't be able to formulate a case around it. Um, and then the third and most common is you want to have some sort of ratio or rate, as you mentioned, so that you can see you are either making progress or you're, you're not making progress. Um, but that's a way to figure out whether a metric is a good metric. So the question that you kind of have to ask, and you should all be reading your lean analytics books, um, is what am I going to do differently based on the information, right? So it's not enough to take these measurements. They actually have to drive some decision making. So for example, looking at something like total sign -ups. It's a total vanity metric, right? I mean, sure, it lets, lets us know that people are signing up for our product, but we can't really do anything with that, right? But something like total active users, well, we can do something with that. We can, first of all, gauge that people actually like our product since they're coming back and they're using it over and over again, especially if we do it over some time period. Um, but hey, maybe we can decide who is really active and possibly monetize off of them. Um, or we can run maybe an A-B test and say, hey, we're going to segment this group and try a new feature out, you know, just with the ones that are really active because maybe they're the loyal early adopters. So, you know, this is a more actual metric. Total signups is a vanity metric. So, some more vanity metrics, which you might not have known. I think in the 90s, number of hits wasn't really a vanity metric. It was thought of as like a really cool metric, but now not so much. Um, number of pages. Number of visits, similar to hits. Uh, number of unique visitors. Sometimes you think, hey, but they're unique, they're brand new. But it doesn't really matter, right? They're not doing anything after they visit your site. Um, even things like followers, friends, likes, the amount of time that somebody spends on the site. Although, you know, that kind of depends on if you're doing something like a user-generated content. I know for Facebook, in the early days, um, they definitely said people were spending on average like two or three hours and at the time, they were able to raise a lot of money off of that metric. I wouldn't advise you doing something like that today. Um, even things like email collected and number of downloads, this isn't really getting at what the business is once again. So the other thing that we have to be careful of is too often we can go down this path of you know, everything has to be measured and we have to show you know, quantitative results in order to figure out what decisions we need to make. But sometimes that doesn't necessarily capture the whole story. And sometimes we have to bridge qualitative with quantitative. So I'll give you a really simple example. Um, in the early days of BusyV, I was getting a lot of people that were signing up, were leaving and coming back and using the product, but just like very, very inconsistently. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, and we were getting like a lot of free, free people. Um, but they would like come back and they would add another customer and they'd be gone for a month and they'd come back and I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I decided to run a little experiment. And everybody that was on the free customer basis, uh, I sent them all a PayPal invoice saying, hey, you've been upgraded and now owe us 30 bucks. And of course, those people got really pissed off, right? And what do you think they did? <laughs> they called me up. And so of course, when I had them on the phone, I'd be like, oh yeah, totally, you know, our mistake, a snafu, but now that I have you on the line, could I find, like, understand why it is you're logging in and going back, right? And they gave me, most people gave me the time of day. So what I found out was there were kind of a few different um, use cases going on. There were some people who hadn't opened their studio yet. They just wanted to test the product out. Then they hand it over to like another business manager to test it out. And they add a customer. So we found like a number of people were doing this. Um, some other folks were comparison shopping. They were checking us out versus other folks. Um, and then there was a third set where they really did have very, very limited set of users. But in general, there were all these various use cases that I wouldn't have been able to look at the numbers and figure out what the heck was going on. Okay, so sometimes you have to get a little bit creative. I'm not telling you to charge all your customers, but you know, figure out ways in which you can basically get people on the phone and talking to you. So it's not just enough to look at database numbers and, and um, business metrics you have to get some anecdotes as well. But the key is that the two stories kind of have to line up. Okay? <coughs> so, um, how many of you have heard of KPIs? Okay. So, it's basically a key performance indicator. Um, a lot of times, business analysts and people like that will use this and really... <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, and, and, I think they gave you guys that for me. But, um, <laughs> Anyway, the reason they're using it is because 
They're trying to figure out what's a leading indicator versus a lagging indicator. And by leading, I mean what's actually growing the business or going in a positive direction. And lagging is things like churn rate, um, people not necessarily canceling, but maybe downgrading to a lesser price plan, right? These are things that you don't want. So those are considered lagging metrics. Uh, and it's up to you to figure out kind of how to formulate those, but then you come up with your list of KPIs. So the other thing that you have to be careful of is this idea of correlated versus causal. Is anybody aware of this? What I'm talking about? Okay, Julian. What is it? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Like in stat class, they always say like you know just because something's correlated usually doesn't mean that it's causal. Sure. Or or it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Right. So I mean, it's kind of trite example would be like, oh, we're all. Do key them will graduate and become successful. So there's just a correlation that we went to Duke and therefore we be successful. It's not necessarily always the case, although we certainly hope so. Um, versus something being causal where, okay, we introduced this new feature and we know that that's what led to more active users or more people monetizing, right? So we have to be careful about factors that we think are related, but they have really no bearing on each other. Um, versus what actually it does have a bearing on each other. Okay, so next we're going to talk about how do we get all this data, right? We, we obviously need some set of data. So there's different methods. Uh, the first is cohort analysis. Uh, second is A-B testing. I know a number of you have asked me about that or have already done some of that. Uh, and then the third is multivariate testing, which is really just A-B testing, you know, on crack. Exactly. <laughs> um, so when we talk about cohort analysis, what we're saying is we're grouping people together um, based on time elements. Like we might say, here are all the people that signed up for our product in January, and then here are the people that signed up in February. Right? So there's different kind of sets like that. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is because <clears throat> time kind of becomes our most controlled variable. Right, because we know what the product was in January, um, but we can't necessarily control demographics and things like that, like the various personas. So we just want to do a high-level um, com comparison based purely on top. So here's an example where um, we've got some average revenue. Okay, so let's assume January through May, um, we're adding about a thousand customers every month. Okay, and as we're adding these customers, we're also refining the product. And what we see is that uh, for each month, we are basically averaging five dollars. Uh, the first month, four fifty, etc. This is how much revenue we're making off of all the customers. Okay, but this is not complete. This doesn't give us the full picture. Does anybody know why? Why might this be confusing? You have to do some calculations okay, to cool. figure out some things you might be interested in, like total revenue. Okay, but what else? And different cohorts might be um, making more money than other cohorts. So like the 1,000 people that came in in January, are they still like doing anything in May? We have no clue. Exactly, right. Because we've been adding features, right? We don't know if between this 1,000 and this 1,000, whether or not, you know, the 450, like there's a 50 cent reduction, is that caused by these people or the people that we added here, right? Who's causing the average to go down? We're not sure. So doing something like this, we don't really get a deep understanding of the features that we added. Are they actually making improvements? Are they helping us monetize? Like, you know, it seems like at some point there's an inflection point where here we go down to 425 and then we're back up to 450. So I don't know what happened there. Also, the average doesn't tell you individually, doesn't, doesn't tell you much of the customer base individually for each month. Exactly. Right. Are you asking a question? Or are you no, this is just a comment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe two. Okay, so, um, you know, this data isn't really telling us anything except what our average revenue is, right, per month for, for all the customers that we have. So we've got to get a little bit more granular to understand that the features that we've added are actually making an impact. So the way that we're going to do that is, once again, we're going to have January through May. We're going to be adding some features. 
Right, but now we've split everything up into cohorts, right? We've got month one users and two and three and four and five, and these just kind of match up to January, uh, February, March, etc. So what we see here is when we look at month one, people are spending five dollars, and then add in our cohort one, um, and then as we add features, they're going up to nine bucks. So clearly, off of month one, we're adding value, and those people are monetizing really well, right? Compare them to people that we added in month five, all of a sudden we're only able to make 50 cents off these people. Right? So even though we've got more features, we're monetizing less off of them. So that <coughs> leads us to, right, this is actionable. We might do some interviews with Group 5 and be like, hey, why are we only make, able to make 50 cents off of you guys? Whereas with one, we're able to make, you know, nine bucks. What's going on here? Is there something significantly different? Um, and, and so we can dig into the data a little bit more. Does it make sense? I'm pretty sure if we priced it that way, they wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> no, but we would just, you know, ask them something else. So does this make sense to people how to do this sort of analysis? Okay. So the key then is we're linking, you know, when we do something like cohort analysis, we're linking the user's experience, meaning the features that we've added and things like that, right? And we might add in a number of things. We might have some features. We might add customer support. We might change the landing page. We might have set up the app. Um, but we're linking it all back to how we're able to monetize. Now, the other two uh, are A-B testing. So uh, this is basically, you know, a number of you have asked, should we do A-B testing? And um, what I always say is A-B testing makes sense when you've got really, really large sets of data. And by really large, I would say 1 million plus. Otherwise, you're just creating a lot of work for yourself to optimize like 1,000 users, 10,000 users, et cetera. And some people do like really minimal A-B testing, like they might change up the email subject line or something like that. That's up to you. Uh, I was going to ask, do you think A-B testing could be useful like really early on to help figure out your value prop? Or, like, your For like a landing page? Yeah, yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah, so it, it could be. And, but, but keep in mind that that it depends on a number of variables, right? Like, are you keeping the, um, like in your messaging, are you trying to attack the same persona of early adopters and then you're changing the value proposition to them? Or are you changing the value proposition and the persona each time? You have to be, you have to be careful about that. Um, but you can certainly test the number of value propositions across one persona, two persona, et cetera. So I certainly said that's okay. Um, so yeah, it makes sense in that regard, but what I often see are people that will build two distinct sets of features, right? And that's a lot of overhead to maintain and to then get a sense of what's working and what's not. Instead, an approach that might be better is to maybe segment a group, kind of like a cohort analysis, and be like, hey, these are our most active users, or maybe these are inactive users. Let's have them try the feature out, see if it works, rather than building two separate things having to deal with all that, having to deal with the customer support behind all of that, right? So it doesn't make sense until you can really get to a scale point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the other, like I said, multivariate testing. At this point, you're just testing a lot of different variables at once. You might be testing how people are monetizing. You might be testing across multiple um, cohorts. You might be testing things like retention, churn rate, etc. Okay, so this is just, uh, once again, A-B testing, but so, once again, the goal of doing all this is that we're trying to drive at some decision making, right? And data is going to help with that. So, the thing that we have to also be careful about is when we're collecting this data, we have to think a little bit like a data scientist, which means the first thing is that the data's got to be clean, right? And by clean, I mean um, if for some reason, you know, you didn't uh, collect the data in don't know, an appropriate way, or there was some period where things were off, um, then you got to make sure you account for that. Um, or oftentimes what I'll see is um, people just have, like, crusty data. Either they're looking at log files, or et cetera, they haven't really parsed through all of it. Um, so the second thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to normalize, uh, normalize your data. And then um, sometimes it makes sense to exclude outliers completely. Like, if there's one person that's, like, using the app 24-7, you're like, why is this guy doing that, right? He's going to throw everyone else off in terms of like active users um, versus, you know, you might exclude them and then you might 
include the outliers as well if there's some, something interesting about them. Right? They might be your evangelists. Uh, and then there are times where you might have to ignore seasonality, right? If you're trying to figure out what your earnings are for the full year, then just having like seasonal peaks and um, values it might not be the best uh, way to, to go about taking your measurements. Um, and then the, the other thing is sometimes you like ignore the magnitude um, when you're reporting growth, right? And, like instead of saying, hey, we grew uh, from 100 to 1,000, eh, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but you might say something like, well, you know, we grew 10x, something like that. Um, and then the last two things I'll say is data vomit, where by that I just mean there's a lot of different sets of data kind of keep um, to one or two metrics or one or two ways of collecting it. Uh, and then, you know, keeping away from things that might be noisy. One thing this is just having clean data. So there's a number of frameworks that people use to kind of keep everything consistent uh, when they're thinking about methods. So I'm going to give you two of those frameworks. Uh, the first one is called the Pirate Framework by Dave McClure. That's why it's called R. Uh, and this is just a really nice funnel that he's created where he says, OK, you're going to start with something like acquisition. And by acquisition, you know, how do people become aware of you? How do you go about getting people to sign up for your products? Uh, and you might do a number of marketing things, right? Uh, then you talk about activation. So after awareness, they might sign up. They might come back periodically. Um, but there might be some things that you need to figure out what, what's actually keeping them activated or getting them to activate. Because the third then is retention. So what's helping them to come by? Do you need to add some features? Do you need to do some check-ins? Do you need to like change your pricing scheme? Uh, and then the, the, the fourth is, OK, now that we've got all these users, how many of them are converting to actually you know, paid users? Uh, and what's it going to take to get them to convert? The final, which is the holy grail, is now that we've got users that are coming in that we're able to generate revenue off of, how does one user then lead to multiple users, right? So referrals. How can we get their friends, their family, their you know, acquaintances, etc., to all give us money? So contrast this to you know, Eric Reese and the Lean Startup approach, and what he's talking about are just you know three basics. How sticky is your product? How viral is your product? And then how many people do you have that are paid? Um, and really what he's always trying to aim for is how viral can you make your product um, and then you know, factor in any sort of churn and loss that you're experiencing. The other two things that he introduces are uh, this concept of CLV, which is customer lifetime value, and customer acquisition costs. <coughs> we're not going to go into too much of that because we're obviously not doing customer acquisition costs at this point. But this would be like running a Google AdWords campaign and then saying, okay, we spent, I don't know, $100, $1,000, whatever, and from that campaign, we were able to get 10 signups. Okay, so then we know it costs about $100 per customer to get them to sign up. Um, but then, what's our lifetime value, right? How much can we monetize? Are these customers then paying $30 a month? Are they sticking around for at least six months? Right, what's the average um, lifetime value? So these are a little more advanced metrics once you've got the product out there, uh, but I just wanted you to be aware of them. So these are just, like I said, some high-level <coughs> frameworks. We're going to dig into each of the areas. So there's, you know, we've talked a lot about marketing, we've talked about product, we've talked about pricing and customers and all of that. So we have to keep metrics on each of these things. It's not enough to just say how engaged or how much money we're making, because it all kind of fits together, right? So we're going to start by talking about marketing metrics. So the first thing, you know, this comes back to mental models, we're figuring out our channels, but we might set up some channels for how we're going to build awareness for our product. And then once we've got those channels, we've got a list, okay, these are the channels that we're going after. Um, but the key thing then is, we have to create a funnel like this, where we say, given the given the channel, right, uh, what's our possible reach in that channel, right? So let's take a simple example where, like, you know, Tito goes to a high school, talks to a bunch of kids, maybe there are like 100 kids in that auditorium. So <coughs> his possible reach is then 100 kids, right? Or it might even be like, you know, uh, multiple schools, whatever. 
Um, but that's a possible reach. And then of that, how many did he actually get through to, that becomes the actual reach. And then how many actually sign up, go on to become active, and paying customers. Right, so this is kind of the funnel that we're aiming to get. So, just to give you an example using my own site, this is just one month. Uh, this is February to March. So there were 1,700 visitors. Of that, 71% bounced. Uh, <coughs> and then from there, um, 190 went to the courses page. But of that, only six people uh, applied for the course. And then, of course, of those six, they went on to pay. I'm not sure how many went on to become referrals. But this is just one channel, the website. Contact this to social media. Um, now I've got, at the time, I had like 2,600 followers. There were uh, 211 people that clicked on a link that said, you know, apply for this course. And then once again, about a 76% bounce rate. 44 applied for the course, um, but only two people paid. So on this, there's like a lot of people applying, but conversion to pay, you know, is much lower. So I might, from there, say, hey, in the future when we do something like Twitter, you know, a lot of people are going to apply, but only a few people are actually going to convert to pay. Could you finish the application without paying? Uh, yes. That was... Oh, that's what you're confused about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You complete the application. It's like Duke. You submit the application, you review your application, and then we contact you if you... Oh, I get you. Apply. So, I mean, this is, of course, I have <coughs> seen some funny stuff in here where, like, there might have been some rejections. I'm, I'm leaving that yes. out. So there's some hand wavy stuff in here. But in general, it's, like, 44 to 2, um, coming from something like Twitter. Whereas, like, on the website, you know, it's, like, 100%. And it, it could be something like, well, you know, on um, something like Twitter, people are just casually walking by. And they're like, yeah, sure, I'll apply. They're not actually going to our site. They're not taking the time to understand everything that we're doing. So maybe they're not the best customers, whereas people that are coming directly to our site, right, they're looking through everything. Um, they're maybe self-filtering. Um, and so they become better students. Okay, so once again, we have to be careful of this, you know, correlation versus causation. Uh, so mentioning that. So the other thing that you have to think about is, um, for example, with email, right? Why are, you, why are you doing all of these things? So you might have something like, okay, we've got some number of people um, on the list, but then, you know, factor out delivered versus bounced. Um, now they might perform some sort of action as well. So the key sometimes is not necessarily always paying customers, but figuring out what the end goal is, right? Because there are some mediums where we can't monetize off of people. Um, and really you might just be doing an awareness campaign or getting them to sign up for the product. So don't always think it's going to be um, you know, money at the end here. Uh, it could be something else. Okay. So the, the key though is you have to think about when you're doing these um, funnels, right? What are the like, implying links? What, what's causing uh, certain people to view certain actions, right? Like the example I just gave with Twitter, why might people um, be signing up, like 44 people signing up, but only two converting to pay. We have to dig in a little bit deeper to get behind the story. So this is where it's not enough to just look at the numbers. We have to think about what's the background story. Okay. So talk a little about marketing metrics. We're going to talk about product metrics next. So once again, with product metrics, we're going to have very similar funnel, right? They're going to sign up, they're going to try it out, and then they're hopefully going to convert to paid and refer more users. But there's a few more factors that we have to think about. So the funnel that you're building here actually really depends on the type of product you're building. Right? Remember I talked um, probably <coughs> a month ago, or maybe less, um, where I said it depends on whether you're building a point tool versus an integrated solution. Right? Where I said something like a point tool, well, people might sign up for it, but they also might leave. Whereas if you build something that's integrated, it might take them longer to decide to buy it, but once they're in your system, like, they're in for a very long time. So you have to think about what your product is and if it makes sense, um, the type of funnel that you're seeing. So the key is, depending on the type of product, how engaged are your customers with your product? And does it make sense? to take certain measurements. 
So I'll give you a couple examples so this makes more sense. So something like Dropbox versus DocuSign, right? These are two products that people use all the time, but it's for a very, very specific purpose, okay? So if I'm not a customer that requests a lot of signatures, then it's probably not going to be a product that you know I'm going to convert uh, customers on. I have to make sure that I really get targeted uh, in terms of the users, right? Similarly with, with Dropbox, if I can't imagine who wouldn't be seeking files every day, but let's just assume I don't like thinking files every day, right? Then clearly, uh, I'm not going to be the most engaged person. I'm not going to find a lot of value out of paying $9 a month for this. Versus something that's very, very frequent, right? And has a lot of use cases. So Facebook, Google, Twitter, right? These are all um, social media sites. They get a lot of daily usage, and on top of that, they have multiple use cases. So they appeal to a wider audience. So I better have a really wide top-level funnel, and hopefully, you know, also figure out a way to monetize. Uh, so that's another thing to think about. Now you might also have something that's less frequently used, okay, with a very specific use case. So Airbnb and Mobismo. This is a travel search engine. Um, when I talked to the founder of Mobismo, she told me, you know, at best, people are going to search 12 times a year for travel, and that's usually like a business traveler. So it's very unlikely that she's going to be able to monetize off of that customer every single time, uh, meaning like every single day. It's going to be more likely that she can monetize off of them 12 times a year. So it doesn't make sense for her to have some sort of um, metric like, oh, we've got to make, you know, 100 bucks off of this customer and we've got to try to monetize immediately. She might have to change how she creates her hypothesis. Similarly with Airbnb, you know, people aren't necessarily staying there every single day out of the year, right? They're probably staying there on a um, less frequent basis, so they've got to figure out how to monetize in the amount of time that they have with the customer. So the key thing to note here is your engagement's going to fluctuate, right? With something like Airbnb, if you're going on vacation, you're going to be really engaged during that time period, and that's where they've got to figure out how to make uh, monetize, um, and then the rest of the time, you know, they know that they're not going to be able to monetize, so they might do some awareness, they might see how often you're browsing, things like that, but they know they're not making any money. Does this make sense to people, how your product use cases also impact your monetization? Okay, so, you know, based on engagement itself, right, that can impact uh, what the product adoption is, as well as pricing. So, it, and, and by that I mean, depending on how uh, engaged they are, right, you might get people that are adopting it a lot, like something like Google and Twitter and Facebook, um, but if you've got a product like a Mobismo or Airbnb, fewer people are going to be adopting it as quickly. So, the other is, of course, if you have a product where people only use it one time or one time a year, then you can't expect to monetize, you know, six months in. You've got to figure out you know, what the time frame is in which you can monetize them. And a lot of times people will have this metric like, oh, we've got to figure out 30, 60, 90 days um, if we can make a dollar, because after that, it's very likely that we won't be able to make any money. Um, and this is also why sometimes people have to, like, spend time optimizing their free trial, uh, because they want to give customers enough of an understanding of the product, but if they let the free trial go on for too long, then the customer's like, yeah, look, there's a bug here, up. Oh, there's like something off here, I'm not going to pay for this, right? Whereas giving them just a teaser, they understand the value proposition and then it's, hey, you want to use more? You're going to have to pay. So the other thing, like I just said, is to think about what features are also going to trigger conversions. And this is going to come back to, you know, obviously looking at what, um, how engaged they are with particular features, um, but also pulling that back into the value proposition of the product as well. So, the key thing, kind of key question you have to ask yourself is how can you possibly, within the product, create an experience that's going to set off some of those triggers? Okay? So it might be something like, yeah, come and check out uh, Career Penguin, but if you're really serious and you want to submit a resume, you know, your first company chose free, but the next 
three or eight or whatever, right? So that they get enough of a teaser, but then at some point, you know, you figure out for them it's really important to get that job. So, you know, is there a trigger around that? So, basically, engagement metrics. The thing to think about when you're thinking about engagement metrics is, you know, understanding how you place features in your products. This is why coming back, you know, always to design and mental models, because how you place it can actually impact um, whether somebody buys or not, right? There's a reason that that one click button exists on Amazon and it's, you know, very, very easy to use. Um, the second, like I said, is looking at the frequency of people's usage. So if you find someone is using a product really frequently, or maybe if you're on a usage model, um, kind of like turn out one, then you might have some pricing around that. Or does one feature lead to another feature, right? You might have some sort of loss leader or some sort of teaser, um, but then, you know, in order for people to get more into the product, uh, you charge them. This is where like the in-app purchases where they're like, oh, buy this little virtual trinket um, would do really well because people are willing to buy those things. Um, but the key thing you have to sort of think about is how can you constrain the user's experience? So this becomes a delicate balance because you don't want to constrain it so much that people get pissed off and leave, but you don't want to offer too much that they feel like, oh, I'm getting you know this thing for free. Right? So you kind of have to test the balance of that. Um, and then the other, the last thing to think about is if people do report certain enhancements or bugs or et cetera, can some of those things be monetized? Right? This comes back to why you have to do your pricing um, early on so that it can guide some of your development. But you might get a customer that says, sure, I'll give you 10,000, 100,000, whatever, to build this particular feature out. Now, if you're curious, we're not going to cover this in the class, but if, if any of you are curious, here are you know, two products you can use to um, do uh, analytics inside of your product. So I think I mentioned that Google Analytics only handles logins, uh, sorry, uh, public websites, right? You can only call public websites. So if you want to figure out what your analytics are internally, um, here are two options. Kiss metrics in this panel. Um, they both do require some coding, so it's not just with a switch, uh, you have to do some, some work. Okay, last, not customer, met or customer metrics. So it's not enough that we test, you know, marketing. That's just awareness, and it's not enough that we just test products. But we've also got to think about who our customers are and the types of customers that we're attracting. So we might look at things, uh, and, and this is beyond the cohort analysis. So we might look at the number of customers that we have. That might be uh, a metric, but it might be something more like active customers or paying customers who might fake in buckets. Um, we might see who's the most recent. Like, is there someone who's buying a lot, right? This might be valid for an e-commerce site. Um, and then the other is, of course, what's our retention, right? Do we have uh, the converse of that churn? So how many people are sticking around, and what does that bucket look like versus the people that are canceling, and can we you know, create some KPIs around that. But like I talked about before, lifetime value. By lifetime value, I don't necessarily mean that the person has to cancel in order for you to figure out how much you've made, right? It can be up to the point that you service them. So, you know, for, for me with Busy, I kind of figured out that most people are sticking around at least for six months once they convert, which means we're making about 100 or $200 a person, or off of one visit. Uh, so that's kind of our lifetime value, and then we can compare that to what's our cost to acquire that customer to stay full, break even, right? So that's acquisition cost. We'll talk about um, profitability in the next slide and, and net promoter score as well. So, like I said, I want you to just think about this. You don't, you're not going to use it in this class, but this is oftentimes neglected. People don't think about their acquisition costs. Um, either because they say, oh, well, we're just doing a bunch of free stuff. The time and that marketing person you hired is still kind of an acquisition cost. So think about that. So it might be something like you know, total cost of sales um, plus whatever your marketing budget was divided by how many customers have you actually uh, been able to acquire. 
So when we're talking about customer metrics, we also kind of have to create a little bit of a funnel, right? So we're going to have people that are purely prospects, right? These are people that maybe just like said, yeah, sure, I'll try your product out, but they haven't actually bought anything yet. Um, and then you'll have folks that are just first-time buyers, right? They're a brand new customer, um, and they might have some sort of persona that evolves over time versus people that are repeat buyers, right? Like, who's signing up every month to use your product, or who's coming back, right? And why are they coming back? Um, and then, of course, you're going to have your core customers that are that stick with you. And then you're going to have some people that defect. And it's up to you to figure out what the persona is behind defectors and what were the variables that led to that. Uh, and then beyond that, obviously, you're going to want to understand who you want to reward, right? Are there certain customers that don't ever give you a support call, pay their bills on time, and they refer more customers to you? Wow, that sounds like a great customer, right? Figure out ways to reward them. Um, and you might even consider how you can grow that subset of customers. So now you've got to come up with sort of a new persona um, within your product. And then you might consider who is like mid to low level profitability, like they've been a customer for a few months, or they're almost at that lifetime value. Um, so how, how might you want to grow them? Um, the other is you might actually decide to fire customers. Um, and by that, I mean maybe deciding, hey, we're going to charge this subset more, and they'll either pay that, which is great, and then we don't mind servicing them, or they'll just say, hey, this product is not for me, right, because you're sending them a signal. Um, or you might even change the marketing message so that you don't attract customers like them in the future. Uh, so I ran an experiment at the end of last year where originally for about a year and a half we have been charging $27 a month. Um, and then we, we switched to charging $57. And I noticed that the people I got at $57 were just nicer customers. Like, they didn't really call us up, they didn't ask us for stuff. But people at 27 were like constantly demanding features, even though they had been with us from very early days and seen us build a lot of stuff. So I'm kind of scratching my head as to why that was. And then I thought, well, at 57, if I get an amazing customer, then at 107, I'm probably going to get an even better customer, right? <laughs> Turns out I was wrong. At 107, I didn't get a single customer. So I went back down to 57, uh, I think I went to 67, uh, and kind of just stayed there. And still get the better customer, um, and, and, you know, we left the people that were on the $27 plan, like we grandfathered them in. They slowly started to churn out, which was fine. Um, and then we just kept attracting the people that we wanted to attract as customers. You know, this is obviously a very different strategy from like, let's pursue growth, you know, forever. Um, so I'm not teaching that in case that's what you guys are after. So the other thing, um, like I said, is the churn rate, right? So we have to keep track of this because this is a KPI. This is a lagging metric. So how many people are unregistering or canceling? And once again, the correlation versus causation, right? Why is it that they're unregistering? Is it because you start charging them more? Or because they are fundamentally unhappy? Or you know they are going to a competitor? Or you release a feature that they don't like? right? Make sure you keep track of what's causing the churn. Uh, and then similarly, what's keeping, what's retaining them, right? Do they, are they on an automatic billing where they're not even using the product, but you're just constantly charging them like a gym membership? Okay, that's not really, you know, explaining if the product is good or not. Um, or are you doing things like promotional incentives? Do you have good support? And so that's keeping them around. Um, and then the third, net promoter. So this is what we're trying to figure out because uh, what we're trying to figure out is how satisfied are our customers. And by that, we want to figure out what percentage of our customers are likely to refer us to someone else. And we're going to subtract that from the number of people who would not recommend us to someone else. Okay, and that's what's called net promoter score. And the way that we can do that, there's not like a really great way these days, um, is basically doing some kind of survey. Uh, we might even look at the number of referrals that we get, or we might look at things like support tickets, bugs that they file. Um, but this is really just an indicator of how well we're going to be able to retain our customers. So the other thing to think about is, you know, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be based off of just a ratio, right? Uh, and uh, it's also going to be coming back to personas. So you might find in the number of people that are willing to promote you, 
they have a certain type of persona, uh, and it's important for you to think about what that is. Um, this is where doing some level of A-B testing may make sense in order to figure out how you can attract more of those personas. Okay, I realized I didn't talk about customer profitability. Um, so let me go back and talk about that. I thought it was on here. So, so um, basically by customer profitability, what I'm talking about is you're keeping statistics on, you know, aggregate how many customers are, what the cost is, right, customer acquisition cost. And then, of course, what's your lifetime value. But then the third component is how much does it how much does it cost to service all of these customers, right? So if your customer support load goes up by a lot and it kind of, you know, increases even more than the um, uh, acquisition costs as well as uh, the lifetime value, and you also find that your conversions are going down, then it's very likely that your customer profitability isn't going to be there. So this is something else to keep track of as a metric. Okay. So last pricing. So, you know, we talked a lot about pricing last time, and I was just talking about pricing in terms of when you're putting a product out there, how do you figure out what price to charge, right? We didn't talk about optimizing, we didn't talk about margins, none of that. So, I'm going to touch upon it a little bit in this lecture. So, the first thing that we have to think about when we think about pricing is now not just what the customer thinks is a fair price that they're willing to pay, um, but also how much of our product is going to be eroded by things like margins, right? So if we do some sort of channel distribution, people are going to want to take away uh, some of our margins there. We might do something like volume pricing, depending on what our product is, um, and that might also affect our um, profitability. Uh, and then this third concept, reservation price, this is sort of what the um, Van Westendorf sensitivity model or price meter was trying to get at, um, which is how much can we charge, like up to what price can we charge, where the customer thinks that they're, you know, feeling a little bit of pinch, but they still feel like the product is high value. So to figure this out, and some of you might be econ majors in here and already looked at this, so bear with me. Um, you know, you're going to look at what your fixed costs are versus your variable costs. Um, but then you're also going to consider it based off of volume. Now, not uh, maybe you're building a physical product. I don't think so. Um, so it, it might not actually be an issue for for you. But if you're building a physical product, this is where unit volume um, really makes a difference because um, you know basically people are only going to let you sell so many units, um, both at the high end and at the low end. So they might say something like. Uh, Whole Foods did to one of my students where they have to have like 50,000 units. They won't sell anything less than that. Um, but then, of course, the price they're going to charge per unit varies, um, or, or not varies, but it kind of erodes their margin. So now they're kind of stuck doing two calculations of how much is it going to cost to produce 50,000 bars and are we able to make a profit um, once Whole Foods takes some of our margins away. Now, the other is you might have, and I know this is kind of hard to read, but you might actually have multiple distributors where um, at each point they're eroding from your margins. So the example that they give here is like first they've got a distributor, then they've got a wholesaler, then they've got a retailer, and then finally they've got the consumer. So this $5 product that the consumer felt like that's the most that they can pay, um, you know, the company has given away 450 of it, so they're really just making 50%, right? So 90% of the margin is because of the distribution. So this, once again, then set, uh, makes us think about, well, do we want to increase the selling price, even though our customers might not like that, or do we want to attract a <coughs> richer customer, right? We might have to change our user segment, but other things to think about. Uh, unlike I talked about before, volume can certainly change it. So this is the example that I was just talking about where I have the student's coolie coolie bars. Um, they make this bar that's created based of moringa. Uh, and initially, she and her team uh, were producing 300 bars a day. And that's about all they could produce on their little startup team. Uh, but then, you know, they got a call from Whole Foods that, said, you know, they said, hey, we'd love to offer this bar in one of our stores, but we're going to need 50,000 units. And so she's like, well, how the hell are we going to produce 50,000 units if 
you're going to produce like only 300 a day, right? So they needed to do a production run. Uh, so the way that they funded it was through a Kickstarter campaign. They raised 50k so they could do a manufacturing run. They also got some free sales through that, but then they were able to, you know, give Whole Foods what they wanted. So we talked a little bit about this already, right? It's the, the price at which a customer will not buy the product. Uh, or sorry, above which, not about, the price above which the customer won't buy the product. So this, once again, comes back to this Van Westendorf price sensitivity meter that we talked about last class.